We are now at the analogies of experience, in which Kant is going to tell us about substance and causation and a community, which will all turn out to be about the relations between appearances in time, so temporal relations. As Kant is going to explain to us here in the introductory part of the analogies of experience, the big difference between the analogies on the one hand and the two previous sections, the axioms of intuition and the anticipations of perception, is that whereas the axioms and the anticipations were about you know, the content of a particular appearance, right, about what we, what we experience when we experience a particular object, right, we have to experience something that is spread out in space and time, uh, and we've got to experience something that has a certain intensity Right, so we can imagine a continuum between the zero of non-existence and the intensity of this particular experience. That is about the content of, of this particular experience. Now, in the analogies of experience, um, when we start thinking about substance and causation, well, we need to do that not in order to grasp this particular content. Right? These are not rules for this particular appearance. They are rules for the relations between appearances. And in particular, they are rules for the temporal relations between appearances. So temporal relations, that is what this is all about. Uh, let's see what Kant tells us. He says in the B edition version that the principle of the analogies of experience is this. Experience is possible only through the representation of a necessary connection of perceptions. So experience is possible only through the representation of a necessary connection of perceptions. So the basic idea here is that experience, right? And experience has to do with objects, right? It's not the mere play of sensations. It is not like some purely subjective, um, like random appearance of all these little sensations of red and bright and sharp and pain and you know it's not that right experience has to do with objects and as we have seen again and again objects have to do with rules uh, to 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 represent my experience as the experience of an object is to represent it as standing under certain rules as having a certain kind of necessity so that experience is possible only through the representation of a necessary connection of perceptions that is not, I would say, um, that shouldn't surprise us. This is something that fits very, very well with everything that we have heard Kant say before. Now, in the first edition version, Kant actually mentions time, which is nice, so let's read that out too. Their general principle is, of all the three analogies of experience, the general principle is, as regards their existence, all appearances stand a priori under rules of the determination of their relation to each other in one time. As regards their existence. Okay, what does that mean? Well, here's one way that, that helps me to understand why Kant goes on about existence here, and he's going to say more about existence later on in this introductory section, um, when he points out that the principles that we are now talking about have the peculiarity that they do not concern the appearances and the synthesis of their empirical intuition, but merely their existence and their relation to one another with regard to this, their existence. Um, one way for me that, that helps me to, to think about that is, okay, let's think about two sort of sensory episodes that we might have. Right? One is the sensory episode in which I perceive this Nietzsche bust. Um, okay, that's, uh, that's something I perceived. Another is the episode where it, I perceived a dragon that tried to swallow me, uh, and then I woke up in sweat, right, in my, in my bed. So I want to say that there was experience of something objective, something that exists in the case of the Nietzsche bust. And there was no such thing. There was a merely subjective experience, if that's the right word, or a merely subjective series of sensations in the case of the dragon that tried to swallow me. Um, that doesn't exist, right? There is no dragon. 
there is no object there. Um, I was not experiencing something that exists. What's the difference? Well, one way to grasp that difference is to see that we, we don't actually represent, at least not now that I think back about it, I don't represent the dragon episode as being anywhere in time. Right? I may represent my dream as being somewhere in time. My dream was last night. Uh, but the dragon, the dragon doesn't exist in time. Right? There's no, no object there that sort of fits into this one time with all the other objects of the world of appearances. Unlike the Nietzsche bust, right? which was created at a certain date, was acquired by me at a certain date in a bookshop in Freiburg, if I'm not mistaken. Um, which I was looking at at a particular date, namely today, uh, and so on and so forth. It's somewhere in space and time, unless, unlike this dragon. So if we think about the existence of objects, right, to, to think of an object as existing, and we're going to see more about this later on in the, in the fourth section, um, when Kant talks about, uh, uh, about actuality, existence, possibility, necessity, and so on. But as regard their existence, when we, when we represent an object as existing, we represent it as being related to all the other objects in one time. Right? And, and thinking of something as, as being in this one time is thinking of it as being related to other objects. Right? Being before them or after them or at the same time as them. Um, so to, to represent something as existing is to represent it as belonging in this one time is to represent it as standing in temporal relations and is to represent it as like not just subjectively standing in temporal relations but really objectively standing in those temporal relations right the Nietzsche bus really is before this and after that um, and contemporary with this other thing and so on and so forth all of that is part of representing it as objective so there are necessary um, um, we must uh, think this as a relation to each other in one time. Um, we must think, it, think of it as a necessary connection, necessary in the sense of rule-governed, um, made necessary by the way that things actually objectively are. Right? That's the way that we have to represent this. Okay, so let's read, I mean, I, I think I've said by saying this, most of what I want to say about this introductory section but let re let's read through the proof together. Proof. Experience is an empirical cognition. That is a cognition that determines an object through perceptions. Right. So we're no longer at the level of this mere play of sensations. We are now talking about objects. It is therefore a synthesis of perceptions, which is not itself contained in perception, but contains the synthetic unity of the manifold of perception in one consciousness which constitutes what is essential in a cognition of objects of the senses, that is, of experience, not merely the intuition or sensation of the senses. Now, in experience, to be sure, perceptions come together only contingently, so that no necessity of their connection is or can become evident in the perceptions themselves, since apprehension is only a juxtaposition of the manifold of empirical intuition but no representation of the necessity of the combined existence of the appearances that it juxtaposes in space and time is to be encountered in it. Right? If I check out the contents of my, of my experience, like there's this object, there's that object, there's this little thing, there's that little thing, none of them sort of um, involve a necessity to anything else. I mean, representing a particular a particular type of sensation at a particular intensity across a particular extension I mean that doesn't involve anything about about you know stuff happening elsewhere right and this is where Hume stops Kant would say this is where what Hume notices but then that is where Hume stops uh, but Kant doesn't think we can stop there I mean we already know of course from the deduction that in the end we have to perform a synthesis that relates everything that happens to this one consciousness, to this one you know, unity of our perception, and um, which requires us representing it as, as this objective, objective world. And so we need to go beyond 
the mere play of sensations. Since experience is a cognition of objects through perception, consequently the relation in the existence of the manifold is to be represented in it not as it is juxtaposed in time, but as it is objectively in time. Okay, so in order to get from the mere play of sensations, which is subjective, to experience, I've got to represent what happens, not as it happens to sort of um, subjectively come to me, but as it really is, as it objectively is in time. Now, we could think of one way of doing that, which is that we experience time itself. Right? Maybe there is like a, 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 a clock that is ticking all the time in all our experiences and it sort of time stamps everything that happens. Um, time itself cannot be perceived, Kant says. And he's going to say this again and again. This is not a true picture. It can't be a true picture because time is a form of sensibility. It's not a thing. Um, but it's not a true picture. right? We can't perceive time itself. So how can we represent things as being in an objective order in time if time itself doesn't exist? Right? The particular events don't sort of generate an order. Time itself isn't there to, to perceive, to, to represent as, as the background against which things automatically get their order. Um, we need something else. What do we need? The determination of the existence of objects in time can only come about through their combination in time in general, hence only through a priori connecting concepts. There have to be overarching rules that tell us how all the experience have to come together um, in time. There have to be these overarching rules about how things hang together in time, because none of the none of these singular things not this singular sort of sensations that we have is going to give us or allow us to represent an objective time order. Like if I, if I represent to myself merely this particular experience that I'm having at a particular moment, I'm not representing any kind of objective time order. Uh, I can't represent to myself time as something that is sensible. And so in representing an objective time order, what I'm doing is I'm representing those singular things, which are the only things I can represent because they're the only things that are sort of there in my, in my experience. I represent them as falling under universal laws, universal rules of time ordering, right? That is the only, only place where something objective can come into play representing things as being objectively in a certain time order is representing them as falling under rules for how everything has to be ordered in time, right? That's the only thing that that representation can come to. And so here we can see something about the kind of, the kind of argument that Kant is, um, that Kant is giving. What Kant is, doing, Kant is trying to think through what is necessary, what is involved in thinking of something, in representing something as objectively being in time. Right? What, is, what is involved in our, in our thinking of objects as being in time rather than merely of, as thinking time as you know, you know, something subjective that, 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 that doesn't belong to objects, that doesn't conform to any rules. Um, well, what exactly is going to be involved is what the first, second, and third analogy will show us. But all of these analogies, what the only thing they can present to us, the only thing they could possibly give us, is a certain rule for how things have to happen in time. That's the only way that objectivity, that, that rule boundedness, can come into our representation of time. And so that is exactly what is going to happen. Now, since these always carry necessity along with them, experience is thus possible only through a representation of the necessary connection of the perceptions. All right. So, so the final thing I want to say about this introductory section is um, Kant makes this distinction between 
constitutive and, and regulative principles. Uh, and what he seems to be talking about there, right? I mean, the constitutive principle is, is the principle that is needed for, for con con constituting this one particular experience here right now, right? I mean, um, in order to have this kind of sensation, we need the axioms of intuition, the anticipations of perception. In order to regulate how all of that hangs together, when these things can come up, right? When I can even have this particular kind of experience, that's what the regulative principles do. And we see here, like again, the distinction between the mathematical and the dynamical uh, principles playing out that Kant made earlier on. Well, that being said, let us move into the three analogies. Uh, the second of them is definitely the most famous one because people have been really interested in what Kant has to say about causation. But we ought to start at the first one, which is the analogy about substance. <laughs> 